Good morning, and welcome to Senior Project Presentations. I am so proud of our young people and so blessed with the privilege of being the coordinator for this team. You will see a consistent theme of service in their choices this morning. Rick Warren, who is the American pastor who founded the Saddleback Church and also wrote the inspirational book, The Purpose Driven Life, also wrote the supported devotionals entitled Serving God by Kevin Weaver. I thought it was very appropriate for this morning. He writes, God did not put you on earth just to live for yourself. He wants you to make the world a better place. Every time I hear somebody say, I live for the weekends, I want to say that. If you're not fulfilling your purpose, you're missing the whole point of life. Ephesians 2.10 says, God has made us what we are and given us new lives in Christ Jesus. And long ages ago, he planned that we should spend these lives in helping others. Now, there's a word for this. It's entitled ministry. Every Christian is a minister, but not every Christian is a pastor. Um, that means you use your talents and gifts to make a contribution in life, to be a giver and not a taker. The Bible uses these kinds of phrases 58 times. Love one another, care for one another, pray for one another, encourage one another, help one another, counsel one another, support one another, and on and on the list goes. It's the mutual ministry of every believer in the family of God to every believer in the family of God. That's the way God meant for it to be. The truth is, serving God by serving others isn't always easy. Sometimes you're going to get discouraged. So what do you do when you get discouraged? You remember two things. First of all, you remember that you're going to receive a reward that's going to go on for eternity. The Bible says that God will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by caring for other believers, Hebrews 6.10. You're going to be rewarded in heaven. And second, you, you remember that God uses every little thing. Nothing is insignificant when you serve God. None of it is in vain. Keep busy always in your work for the Lord, since you know that nothing you do in the Lord's service is ever useless. 1 Corinthians 15.58. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of ministry. Thank you for these young people that are so committed to you. We so appreciate their example, and I ask that you be with them in a special way this morning. And as always, thank you for the sunshine. We love you so mu much, Lord, in your precious name. Amen. Designing and printing t-shirts for your school is a great way to bring groups of people together through art. For my senior project, I decided to design and print shirts for seniors on the basketball team this year. On the side, I also made a couple of designs for the Academy Day shirts. Before I decided to do this senior project shirt, I planned on volunteering and trying to learn screen printing from this place called Carpenter Screen Printing. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to because of COVID-19. So, since I already had screen printing supplies at my house, I made a decision to learn with my dad instead, and then hopefully be good enough to print a couple shirts for a small group at Gem State. I started off by brainstorming designs for the shirt at the beginning of the school year. One of them looked really bad, so I got rid of it. Another one that I found looked really good, so I edited it by filling in lines, making stuff bigger, and adding and erasing things to my liking. After playing around for a bit, I decided that adding names to the design made it look pretty cool. I showed the seniors the design and asked them what color shirt and ink color they wanted. The choices were red, blue, white and black shirts. 
I also asked if they wanted long sleeve shirts or short sleeve shirts. I went shopping at Walmart, Michaels, Hobby Lobby, and Hobby Lobby in search for what brand and materials would work best for the project. Walmart and Michaels didn't have anything I was looking for, but Hobby Lobby was great. They had a great selection of Gildan long sleeve shirts in every color I needed. Every color except blue. So, since they didn't have blue, and only one person uh, wanted a blue shirt, we changed that shirt to a gray shirt. Following how the traditional printing process works, my dad and I printed the design onto a clear sheet of plastic paper called a transparency. Before we did that, we had to edit the picture color settings so that the blackest, the black was the blackest it could be on the transparency. We spread this stuff, we spread this stuff called emulsion onto a printing screen and we let it settle for about two hours. What emulsion does is it dries and hardens as you expose it to light and heat unless there's something black in between the emulsion on the screen and the light. That's why when you have a transparency with a black image on it, it will harden everything around the image. Then you can wash the unhardened parts off the screen and press ink through it. You can press ink onto paper, shirts, hoodies, and more. The ink won't go through the hardened areas. Luckily, my dad had worked at a screen printing business before, so he had experience. Here are some of the designs he made. So, we hardened the emulsion <coughs> on a screen with a heat lamp. On top of the screen was, a, was the transparency paper with the image on it. I figured out that we could use a lampshade to keep the light above the screen without having to hold it with our hands since the lamp got really hot. After hardening the emulsion for about 10 minutes, we washed the emulsion off the screen to get our image and it failed. In this photo are unwanted spots that washed out, which means we didn't burn the emulsion on the screen for a long enough time. Lots and lots of mistakes were made in the process. Sometimes I put too much emulsion on, and sometimes I burned it for too long. But it was a fun learning experience. We had a suspicion that our old wooden screen was too worn out, so we bought a new metal one. I took some time to test the screen out, and I got way better results. Only this time, we just got stuck not being able to wash out all the details. We practiced using the screen on other shirts to make sure we didn't ruin the shirts I got for the seniors. Through a shadow. My mom is involved in the real estate business. She was talking to me about how she gets good aerial photos of the houses she sells, taken by a drone pilot lady that she hires. I like taking, well, we thought it might be a great idea to shadow her job for a day since I like taking pictures all the time. So, after setting up the date, we drove all the way out to Emmett, past or to Sweet Idaho. This is the place where she took aerial photos for a man selling about 100 acres. It ended up being a blast, and she taught me a lot about how her job works. She taught me about which drones were good to use, how much she gets paid, how busy the job was, and how she started her job. She even chased some wild turkeys around with a drone for fun. After that, she explained how she works for a website called tourfactory.com. What this website does is advertise photographers and other services to real estate agents such as my mom. My other mission was to design shirts for Academy Days. I called the business that Gemplate uses to print their Academy Day shirts and asked them for prices for certain types of shirts. Then I just designed a couple of shirts on the custom ink website. My goal was to go for a simple African American theme. Turns out there was a contest for designing the Academy Day shirts, which made this part of my project a little bit more interesting. In conclusion, my project included a lot of experimenting, a lot of designing, and a lot of stressful times. I can say that I've learned this year more than any other year because of this project.
I learned how to humbly fail and immediately try again. I played around with a lot of different ink colors and even made some of uh, some shirts for um, some of my own shirts for fun. I really enjoyed <coughs> I really enjoyed my career shadow because I thought that the drone piloting job looked really fun. My favorite part of the project was definitely designing. I enjoyed messing around and finding out what looked cool and what didn't. I wanted to give the senior basketball players something different and something unique. I've been playing basketball here for five years now, so I was more than willing to do this project for them. I will have the rest of the shirts done in the near future. Thank you. Music education opens doors that helps children pass from school into the world around them, a world of work, culture, intellectual activity, and human involvement. The future of our nation depends on providing for our children with a complete education that includes music, proclaimed Gerald Ford, America's 38th president. For a child to achieve maximum growth and development, music is essential. Now ask yourself this question. What is music to you? Is it a song you listen to on repeat? Is it an escape from reality? Or is it practicing a piano song until you know it both forwards and backwards? Music is all around us, but many choose to neglect the positive impact it gives us. Whether you realize it or not, you are affected by music. If you do not spend hours practicing an instrument or singing, then you spend hours listening to your favorite song. Through the amazing impact music holds, there are many ways you can express yourself through it. As many of you probably guessed, Music is what I decided to base my senior project on. Teaching guitar and ukulele to my young students will greatly enrich their lives. This will become very beneficial on their mental and emotional development and create a great impact on our community. I began my senior project the summer before my senior year. I chose to teach guitar and ukulele because I wanted to provide kids with the opportunity to learn a new instrument. I started with discussing what to do with my mentor, Ms. Vitti. From there, I discussed with Laura Springer when and where these lessons would take place. Laura Springer is the principal at Caldwell Adventist Elementary School. Next, I made flyers, planned lessons and put together music, and it was not long before parents started to reach out to me asking if their kids could join. I started with five students, but the number doubled to 10 as the lessons progressed. I have four in guitar and six in ukulele. The lessons take place around 12.30 on Fridays, and I alternate each week with one week being guitar and the next week being ukulele. In my lessons, I teach different chords, new exercises to help them learn each chord quicker, along with playing and singing songs to practice. My ukulele kids are in third and fourth grade. They love to talk and play games, while my guitar kids, who are in sixth and eighth grade, are very quiet and attentive. Teaching both ages leads me to become more creative in my teaching style to see what teaching tactics work well with each group. I have successfully taught each group around seven chords and we are able to play full songs now. Through teaching them chords in the key of D and G, my students can find any song they want to play. Teaching these eager and determined kids has become something I look forward to every Friday and something my students also look forward to every Friday. Something new and exciting happens every time and it's always fun to see what happens next and to share these awesome memories. The highlight of my teaching is when I get to sit back and listen to them play. Here is a video of my ukulele kids playing one of their first songs, Let Us Come Together. Now here is them a couple of weeks ago playing Jesus Loves Me without me playing with them.
My ukulele kids are always eager to sing and play, and my guitar kids are very strong in their playing and switching of chords. I'm proud of all the hard work they have put into practicing. Goals I have throughout the rest of the year include to have my guitar kids play a couple songs with my praise group. I think this will benefit and enrich them greatly when they eventually come to Gem State. I'm also working on a couple of songs for my ukulele kids to play at Gem State Academy Church. I think these will be great musical experiences for both groups. My senior project is bringing music into these kids' lives, which will ultimately benefit their mental and emotional development. Through researching music's positive impact in my research paper helped enforce and show the value of my senior project. Multiple studies have been done on the brain with results showing music to be effective. A 2016 study at the University of Southern California's Brain and Creativity Institute found musical experiences in children's childhood can accelerate brain development in both language and reading skills. According to the National Association of Music Merchants Foundation, learning to play an instrument can improve mathematical learning and even increase SAT scores. Through these studies, we can see how music not only benefits the right side of the human brain with creativity, but the left side of the human brain with mathematics. Along with music producing positive brain developments, music can also have a huge impact on social and emotional development. The famous philosopher Plato elaborates on this concept when he quotes, music is a more potent instrument than any other for education because rhythm and harmony find their inward wit places into the, <laughs> find their inward place of the soul. Playing an instrument can increase self-esteem, confidence, persistence, and self-discipline. The Miami Music Project, Florida International University's community-based research institute conducted a study. This study looked at how school music programs affected the five C's of social development. The five C's of social development are confidence, competence, caring, character, and connection. This study involved 180 children, all within the ages of eight to 17, for a period of three years while they were participating in an orchestra. When the results came through in February of 2019, they found all these students showed significant increases in all of the five C's. I have seen an increase in all of the five C's through my students. Both groups started out shy and quiet, but as the classes continued, they had become more outgoing, and I have seen an increase in their confidence and competence. These lessons have established a connection between me and my students, one that will be a positive memory to look back on. Starting my senior project, I did not know at first how this could benefit our community. However, when I remembered how I was taught both guitar and ukulele, I knew this was something I wanted to start. When I was in third grade, I was taught basic guitar. And when I was in fourth grade, my teacher began to teach both guitar and ukulele to the kids at my school. I remember leading out in school chapel music with those kids and experienced playing up front at church services. Looking back on how I learned and the kids I learned with encouraged me to start this project because I know firsthand that it works. I am passionate about this project because it is one I can personally relate with. By teaching these young kids guitar and ukulele, it opens the doors for them to continue to use our talent to praise God. This project benefits our community because it is a way to bring the younger generation into our church. This is a way to create leaders who will take over when we leave or move on to different opportunities. It is important we teach them what we have learned to inspire and encourage them so that when they are here, they can take our spots on the praise team or as the next praise team leader, as the next artists or the next spiritual vices. The future is with us, with them. Let's inspire others to become the next leaders. In conclusion, my senior project has not only influenced and inspired me, these young kids, but has also inspired and helped me grow in many ways. I have learned I have more patience than I thought I did. This has helped me step out of my comfort zone and teach, which was something I was never interested in. This has also provided a possible side job if I may need it in the future. Overall, this has taught me the value in the younger generation and how lessons or other opportunities like this can create the biggest impact. Providing these young kids with the gift of music will ultimately have positive benefits on their mental and emotional development. 
This project has been seen to improve me, to improve these kids, and to improve the community. Through the simple action of teaching music, you can inspire and inflict positive change on others. I cannot wait to see the change these kids will make in the years to come. Through learning and playing music, it will be seen in these future years to raise a new generation of leaders. I'd like to thank my mentor, Ms. Fetting. She was the perfect mentor for this project, and I really appreciate all her guidance and help. I want to thank my parents for always supporting me in everything I do. I'd like to thank those who sent donations and contributed to my project. And lastly, I want to thank my guitar and ukulele teacher from elementary school. Her name is Susan Byers, and she inspired me to make this my senior project. If she had not taken the time to teach me at the young age of nine, I would not have gotten this amazing opportunity to make a difference in these young kids' lives. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm standing up here because it's required for graduation. But I am also up here to show you my senior project and what I've accomplished in the last six months. I decided that since I love bikes and um, I just really love to work on them, um, decided my plan was to get an old bike that needed some serious love and then fix it up and give it to a homeless shelter. Not only was this idea fun and very attainable, but it would provide a great service to the community by providing transportation for the homeless. So, now sit back and relax and listen to my ventures over the past six months. Finding a bike was a little harder than I planned. I started by going from thrift shop to thrift shop, hoping to find a bike that I could buy, f buy for very little or maybe nothing, hopefully free. My luck just wasn't working until I finally came to St. Vincent de Paul. I didn't see any bikes at first, but I asked if one of the employees could check the back just, just in case. I was told they might have one that they were going to throw away. I waited, and sure enough, an old gentleman came back with a nice old bike that they were just about to put in the dump. I thanked the gentleman and put it in my car and drove back to get started working, it, working on it. So after I had gathered the materials and set the bike up, um, I got my materials together, which is um, isopropyl alcohol. Stuff is amazing. It cleans grime and dirt off of literally everything. I swear by this stuff. Anyways, I got to work cleaning all the grime and grease off the bike. It took a while since the bike was caked with all sorts of wonderful little brown dots and grease. The gearing was really, really gummed up. The derailleur was stiff and barely functionable. Um, so just for reference, I will explain what I'm talking about. So this is the derailleur, and it's connected to the gearing. The gearing is what makes the bike move. So when I pedal, it's connected to the pedals, and the chain runs back and connects to the gears, and the derailleur moves back and forth so you can go faster or slower. So the derailleur was barely working. Um, it was, I was really worried about it because they're kind of expensive to get a new one and that would like be way more valuable than the bike to buy a brand new one. So, um, anyways, I was determined to make it work. So I cleaned it off and then grabbed the magic lube. So I started to pour lube into the gearing and crank the pedals. By doing this, I can get the lube everywhere so the gears will stay nice and loose for years to come. After 
cranking and lubing and cranking and lubing and cranking and lubing. I finally got it to work. Finally. Oh, man, it took forever. But, oh. So, after that, you have to clean the dirt off of the gearing. Otherwise, actually, no, you have to clean the lube off of the gearing. Otherwise, it will collect dirt very quickly. This is extremely important because your lube job will basically completely destroy the bike if you leave it on there. It will collect dirt twice as fast. So cleaning the access lube is one of the most important parts of the job, so it is not a sticky, drippy mess. Um, next, I replaced the seat because it was full of holes and was starting to fall apart. Imagine a poor old homeless man riding down the road when all of a sudden his seat falls off. You can imagine the pain he would go through when he sat down on a metal pole. So, of course, I needed to fix this part and get an adequate seat for it. I found a nice seat in my stash of bike parts in the get back of the garage and plopped it on there. I also put on new pedals, which will hopefully last for many years. Another added bonus to this bike is a solid tube I added to the back, um, back of the, the back tire to lower maintenance. Flats are really, really irritating, and so having a solid tire will lower the fixing this bike needs. I left the front tire a regular pneumatic tire, which means air, which is what most tires are, because the front tire is very easy to take off and fix, and it's also safer to have a softer tube. This will hopefully last a homeless man many, many years. So after I had tested the bike for many hours and made sure that it was running smoothly, I put it in the back of the truck and drove it down to the nearest homeless shelter. I pulled the bike I pulled the bike out of the truck and walked it towards the homeless shelter. I felt, it felt like a fresh new ride ready for action and adventure. As I walked along the sidewalk, I thought about all the things I'd learned from this project. For one, I learned how to be resourceful and how to fix up an old bike. Second, I learned how to manage my time and not procrastinate, for the most part. I hope this bike will continue to bless someone for many years. Fixing up something that you don't use and giving it to someone isn't that hard at all. I have a new mindset now. This world is not our home, so share what you have, and with a little effort you can bless someone and potentially change their life. So go out there and give what you have because there are always those in need, and all it takes is a little effort to change someone's day. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm going to assume that school is a place that many of you want to feel safe in. Now and possibly the next few years, you will be spending much of your life here. In fact, you will practically live at the school for some more literally than others. So it only makes sense that you should feel safe here. I have a desire to make sure that this need is met for our campus, and I decided it would be best to incorporate it into my senior project. Specifically, I wanted to be able to do some work that would improve areas of our school safety-wise, as a, and as a whole, it's my hope that in any way, even subtly, I benefited the lives of my fellow students. So I want to start by describing exactly what it is I'm doing for my project. The first part of the project involves building some chain link fence gates. One of the main security risks that we figured out when looking around for what I could do is that there is an issue of trespassers. Many trucks and cars who have no associations to Gem State tend to drive through the back roads of our campus. They could be doing this either because they want to cut through traffic or because they want to steal whatever they can grab back there. In fact, as I was working on it, this truck with people I've never seen before drove by. I waved. <laughs> either way, it's dangerous just for the students 
not just for the students, but potentially anyone who lives in the staff houses, because the road that I'm blocking off is right next to them. And the second part of my project is brightening up our parking lot. As many of you know, the parking lot can get pretty dark, especially when coming home from a sports game or another school trip. And although the parking lot isn't very far from any of the buildings, it would be nice to have a bit more sight when returning or leaving from your car. And not often, but sometimes, people who are there may think it's a good place to hang out, which is, understandably, also a security risk. But the lights are available, and will work when my project is complete. So I chose to work on these projects for three main reasons. Firstly, working on safety projects will be beneficial to my future career in public service. I also have the desire to help those around me, all of you. And I wanted to do that in the best way I could, which leads me to my final reason. It's much easier for my sanity to do manual labor than to teach children how to do different things. So before I go on explaining on the process of how I got it all working, I want to talk about the career path that I'm taking that led me to choose the project I chose. For, for my job shadow, I was able to ride along with the police Middleton, Depart Middleton Police Department. This is actually my first police ride along, so I was pretty excited. And I definitely was able to learn a lot about what will hopefully be my future job for a long time. The officer I rode with was named Frank Esquivel, and he had plenty to tell me. Particularly, I want to highlight the main things that I took away from this experience. So the first thing I learned was how the process of how to become a police officer. Before this, I was a little concerned about college choices and the decisions that I would be making. But after he told me how the whole process works and how he got through all of it, I'm much more confident in the direction I'm going. The second thing I learned was what it's like on the job. I had first-hand experience of how the police officers respond to different situations and what kind of situations they're called to. And the last and coolest thing I learned was how to use all the, poli the cool police gadgets on the car. I always wondered how the police were able to know everything about you when they pulled you over, and now I know all their secrets. Frank also showed me how to use the sirens, the computers, and even an angry voice that would say, pull over, over a loudspeaker. Overall, it was a pretty great experience. Now, going back to my project, as I've said, I wanted to make some gates for the back roads of the school and light up the parking lot. So at the start, I faced a couple of challenges. The main obstacle being the weather. This obstacle is the one that led to many other obstacles. For one, it made the ground incredibly tough to dig. In fact, in the majority of the time that I've spent on this project has been working on the ground in order to have a spot to put my gate posts in. Honestly, that all adds up to a couple of hours. Getting through three feet of dense dirt is already hard, and it feels like you have to do a lot of work for a little bit of progress. So just imagine the feeling coming back after a series of snow days, seeing them completely filled up. Not the greatest feeling, but we can't put the pipe posts in without those holes. Setting up the pipe post is the next step in my project. However, the first time I attempted to work on them, I actually almost lost them. They were attached to the back of a truck, about to be hauled off to some scrapyard. If we look for them any later, it's possible I would have even had to change my project. And now I had the task of moving these pipes to the front of the shop back there. I'd like to thank Kyle and Austin and Jaden for helping me to do that, because I know they were pretty heavy. After we moved them, we had to begin the cutting process. We needed to use a saw blade to cut through the pipes into four equal pieces to make two gates. And because the pipes are so heavy duty, the first saw blade we used got dull before we even finished them. So I had to buy a new one, and we were able to cut four pieces about seven feet long. Afterward, I went to buy the chain link fence that we would attach to the post in order to make the barrier. To attach the chain, I first drilled holes into the tops of the post. I then put a small loop bolt into the holes, and for one, well, for one side, and then for the chain link, I looped one of the bolts through the chain and connected it to the post as well. A little complicated, but you'll see what I mean. Since I've completed this, I've begun the process of setting up the post and painting them. As I've said, the holes are what's taking the longest for this part. But once they're deep enough, I have to bring the post over to each of the locations Two of them will be behind the mechanic shop. Another will be on the corner of the baseball field. And once moved, I'll place them in the hole, make it sturdy with a dirt foundation, and I'll paint with yellow spray cans 
so they are easily noticeable, and no one will have any excuses for their trespassing anymore. After that, I attach the post together on both ends using the chain, and this part is done. So putting it all together, I had to buy the things that I needed to make sure the tool, I had the tools available that, so my project would work. And then I would do the work on the pipe material, the cutting, the drilling. Then I would attach the pieces together so we could connect them easily. And I'd set them up with the holes I dug, paint them, create the barrier and the chains. So the second part of my project involves the school parking lots. As I've already explained, it gets pretty dark out there. So I wanted to do whatever I could to change that. Completing this part of the project is a simple three-step process. First, it begins with cutting off the branches that surrounds the lamps, so preventing the light from getting through, which, making, which is the main reason that it's really dark out there. Then, afterwards, I clean up the mess so the parking lot is not scattered with branches. And then afterwards, I simply just power them on. So as far as things that still need to be accomplished, I need to finish the painting, final setup of the gates, and working on the lights, and the project is finished. Although I've done some things to make our campus feel safer, I'm sure there are plenty of other ways to keep improving. I challenge the younger classes to keep an eye out for more ways to make this possible. Don't be afraid to talk about it, because you never know how it might be beneficial to you in the future. No matter how you go about it, Figuring out ways to protect your fellow classmates is always a good thing. I want to thank Coach Perkins for helping me through every part of this. You've allowed me to make my ideas of a school safety senior project a reality, and have given me the instruction and resources to do so. I would also like to thank my parents for giving me whatever financial support I needed. And finally, I'd like to thank everyone who offered their advice or outside help so I can complete everything that I wanted to do. I wasn't done, but it's safe to say that all of us have the desire for security while attending school. Many of us spend a majority of our lives here, and some even live on campus or very close. School should be a place where worry is limited and education is the focus. Overall, my goal is to improve the quality of life and education for everyone attending Gem State Adventist Academy. It is my hope that everyone's experience here has been improved and that they have a more sound peace of mind. Now you can clap. Have any of you ever spent a day, one day, without shoes? Not a day at home, but say a typical day where you walk to school, get some exercise on a break, then say you walk to the store afterwards, then walk home once you're done. No, right? We don't go outside without shoes because we need protection on our feet to prevent us from harmful things on the ground and infection. We are supplied with shoes, and you may not realize it, but we are privileged. The typical day you spend with shoes on your feet is similar to the typical day of a life of an orphan in Guatemala who has no protection on their feet. They still play soccer, they race each other, they take walks, and many other things. This, this is the reason why I chose to send as many shoes as I could get to Los Pinos Orphanage in Guatemala. But there was a very long journey to get to this point in my project. So this is where I tell you my journey, from where I started to where I finished. At the end of my junior year last year, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to volunteer in the pediatric oncology department at a local hospital here in the Valley. In case you have no clue what I mean when I say pediatric oncology, this essentially means children with cancer, children who are cancer patients. I started to prepare and called many hospitals within the valley and finally settled on St. Al's. 
I told them I wanted to bring a small group, aka you guys, to volunteer once a month in helping with whatever they needed and also interact with the kids and give them toys that had been donated for them. Sounds like a pretty good plan, right? I was so proud of myself for figuring it out early and not procrastinating, which is something I do quite well. All the teachers can attest to that. And the future looks so bright and beautiful. And then, boom. COVID-19 was now a major problem for the United States. In result, school went online in March, stores and restaurants began to close, no more toilet paper, people lost jobs, hospitals were no longer as friendly, and therefore my senior project plan was not only put in the trash, but torn apart, stomped on, and then incinerated. I needed a new plan. After some weeks of thinking about it, I came up with a new blueprint. It was an idea that, at the time, seemed a little far-fetched and unattainable. This original rough sketch was the birth of my current senior project. The idea was to send letters and handmade bracelets to any orphanage in a country of my own choice. My first thought was Thailand, since Gem State already has connections to that orphanage since they have gone to a mission trip there already. But this ended up not, not working out, and so I was back to the drawing board. I then chose to send things to India, since my mentor, Pastor Ever, had connections to an orphanage there. This also ended up not working out. At this point, I was feeling very discouraged since it was already late October and my senior project was getting nowhere. At this time, I completely shut down. I didn't even want to think about my project for a month and a half. After this time, I decided to, I needed to pray to, for God to bless my project. From this moment forth, I prayed frequently, sometimes multiple times a day throughout the rest of this journey for my senior project, and that God would bless the entire thing and that at least one person other than me would benefit from it. This is probably the single most important thing that I could have done for my project, and you'll see why. A couple days after I started to pray, Guatemala came up as an option and was a feasible option as well since the school had been planning a mission trip there last year and didn't get to go due to COVID. I called the main contact for this orphanage as soon as I could and asked what their biggest, biggest need was. His answer? Shoes. He said that they have difficulty obtaining shoes since the children are always growing and shoes eventually r get ruined anyway. At that moment, I, didn't, I don't really even remember thinking about my response before I answered him. I just said, I could do that. And by then I had already said it. So now I had to figure out a way to get a buttload of shoes to Guatemala. <laughs> do any of you have any idea how expensive it is to send a box weighing approximately 50 pounds to another country? Because when I agreed to this, I did not have that knowledge in mind. <laughs> I'll just tell you right now, it's expensive. It was about $800. And I'm normally an optimistic person, but this was too much money for me to acquire in such a short amount of time. I kept praying and decided not to worry, and decided to worry about this later, purely because I just didn't want to think about it at the time. In the meantime, I had asked my home church in Susanville, California, for shoe donations, and boy, I did not expect how much love my church family showed me. After three weeks, the church members had collected and donated over 100 pairs of shoes, some being sandals, some tennis shoes, some soccer and football cleats, and even tiny little baby shoes I can't stop staring at. These shoes were all able to fit into two suitcases with careful and strategic tricks like stuffing the littler shoes into the bigger ones just to make everything fit. This was already such a huge blessing that I knew only God could have helped me with. While this was going on in my hometown, I had some students here at Gem State making lots of cards to send with the shoes. We ended up with over 50 cards thanks to their willingness and creativity. So thank you guys. But I still needed 
to find someone to actually take all of these things to the orphanage or else all of this would be for nothing. After some more prayer, an opportunity came about through one of my friend's relatives. I had finally found someone to take these shoes. And I was so excited. And this was my plan for about a month until a couple days before I shipped the shoes, I found out that the contacts were not actually going to an orphanage. They were just planning on going to Guatemala in general. Their generous offer still stood to take the shoes, but would mean someone would have to meet them in Guatemala to get them to an orphanage that was six hours away. So I was now back to the drawing board once again. You would think that at this time I would be very concerned, but I knew that for some reason these shoes needed to get somewhere in Guatemala. God had made that very clear with guiding my project so far. So I prayed and had little worries. The next day, I called that same man who told me that the orphanage needed shoes in the first place. I was just looking to see if maybe he knew someone that was going sometime soon. When I told him my dilemma, he answered, saying, oh, well, that's perfect. I just recently decided I wanted to take a trip down there myself sometime this year, so I could take them if you want. Well, of course I would want that. Thank you so much. How much will it cost? No cost. At this point, I was absolutely sure that God was with me and my project. He had gotten this entire thing from point zero to fully being taken care of with no costs. This project has given me a whole new meaning to the saying, try, try again. Even though I did break down once or twice, I never gave up. I found a quote by Angus Buchan that says, there's power in prayer. When men work, they work. But when men pray, God works. I've related so much to this quote throughout my entire project, and it has been the reassurance I have needed in rough times. But in the end, the children in Los Pinos Orphanage will now be able to play soccer, run, and take walks with brand new shoes on their feet. And I have the satisfaction of knowing that I had one small part in that. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. School is more than a building. It is a community. Students, teachers, and events that make up the entire school experience, bringing us together and strengthening our community from within. It ties us together regardless of our race, our religion, and our gender. When given the opportunity to choose an opportunity to do the senior project this year, I knew from the first moments that capturing the beauty of the school community was what I wanted to do. All, I wanted to accomplish this through pictures. Seemed pretty easy, right? I knew, that from, I knew that it wanted to include photography and cameras. I had originally wanted to model my project after a senior who graduated two years ago, Kelton Turner, but wanted to make it my own. I spent many nights of how I could think about it being orig original and with the help of Miss Mitchell and my mentor, Mrs. Stone, an idea was formed. Taking pictures of the daily student life to include in the JAG rag, the daily newsletter that's sent out for the school. Ida Haven. We attended events, took pictures, and came up with questions for the JAG rag. From the community aspects of Ida Haven, from the beginning of the summer, where we got to know each other within the first weeks of school, to dorm life, talking in the lobby, eating meals together, and getting the whole living together experience, and Vespers, 
where we worship together and get to know who God is through our activities during Vespers. Each week, there were different opportunities to take pictures, and I really enjoyed them all. I also took pictures of intramurals, from volleyball to softball. Volleyball was one of the favorites. Floor hockey, all of the different events where the students came together and played some sports, because why not? Each week, I strived to capture a new element of what Gem State life was like. From Idahaven again, to more dorm life, and even a trip to the zoo that the dorm took over one weekend. Photography is something that has always stuck out to me. It has always been fascinating, and from the history of the first cameras to photojournalism, my research paper topic, I knew from the get-go that my project needed to include the element of photography. I wanted to, once again, capture what happened in the Gem State family, and my goal was to spread the amount of joy that photography has brought me to other people, to other students, other teachers, other staff, and within our community. Ever since I can remember, I've always had a camera in my hand, whether it's my phone or an actual camera, I've always liked to look at the world through a different lens. I was made to have a camera in my hand, just like some people were born to play sports, some like that were born to perform music, and some that were able to be crafty and artsy. I just knew that this was my calling. And although I'm not looking at a profession outside of high school that involves photography, I want to go into elementary education. I wanted to find a new way to do this. It has brought me closer to other people, other students, our community, and even though this project isn't based around something typical, like a blood drive or giving to a homeless shelter like some other people did, I felt like my project gave back to the community in an original way that only pictures are capable of doing. And with the whole COVID-19 out outbreak, I wanted to find a way to make this easy, and this was what the answer seemed to be. I like to think of my project as being a new and exciting way to show the students what goes on in, from a different lens, in a way that pictures are only capable of doing. Spreading joy and making others feel like they are involved in what Gem State is really about through the pictures showcased each week. Our worships, our teachers, our classrooms, essay events, dorm life, meals, and so much more. And even the pictures don't really sum up what it's really about. Even in this rough and uncertain time where physical contact is limited, social distancing is now a thing, a picture can really speak a thousand words and make us feel as though we are really in the moment. So, how my project morphed. As I got a better idea of what was happening each week within my project, I thought it would be interesting to change it up. After doing the same thing week after week, I wanted to really just add some variety and after meeting with Mrs. Stone one day, we concluded that it would be great to get to know the student body in a new and interesting way. And that's how the question of the week was born. Some of you have probably seen the countless emails that I've sent out, and I now understand the pain of having to check your email and the frustration that teachers feel when they send emails out and it feels like nobody sees them. Asking silly questions and then adding responses with pictures to the newsletter is what I wanted to do now. I love this new element of the project. I asked questions such as, what invention would you uninvent and why? And got answers such as toasters, humans, no need for explanation, and girls' pockets and clothing. And this lengthy answer from Lauren explaining how she would uninvent the little tab on cereal boxes because they serve virtually no purpose. And other questions such as, if any song could play when you entered a room, what would it be and why? Again, I got so many diverse answers and it was amazing to see a little piece of personality in each answer. From The Greatest Showman to The Beatles, to creepy carnival music, popular TV uh, songs such as Friends and classics such as Beethoven. Other questions I've asked include, what is your favorite Bible verse? Or what's your favorite animal? 
and the best lessons that you've learned at Gem State. And I most recently did one for the dorm students explaining what they love about dorm life. In conclusion, even though my project was frustrating at times, checking the emails, having to transfer things from documents to documents, sorting through folders, I learned amazing things while doing it, from patience and how to use my camera in new ways. I sorted pictures hour after hour, and I learned how to enjoy the little things when shooting pictures. It's amazing to see what life looks like behind the camera instead of in front of the camera. I had a new perspective, quite literally, and I'm not the only one that can learn something. As many of you will be embarking upon your project as you've already done them, as you've heard, or even doing it in one, two, or even three years, I have a few challenges to leave you with as you go forth and pursue life both in and outside of high school. Now, later, or whenever, in the future, things that you would have learned in the past, and those are to go find a community that you can bring joy to, to establish yourself within that community. We all add different elements, beautiful, and the way that we interact with one another. You should go find your passions while you're a part of that community, whether it's photography or biking, volleyball or arts and crafts. And as I mentioned earlier, you should go chase your dreams and passions with everything inside of you and don't let anything ever stop you and get in your way. And even if things get in your way, as we've seen, there's always a way to work around it. You can accomplish almost anything that you put your mind to, even if it requires looking at life from a different perspective. Always remember that. I would also like to thank my mentor, Mrs. Stone, as I wrap up. I would like to thank her for her patience with me, her willingness to sit down and work through projects and ideas that I didn't really have any idea of what I was doing, and her accomplishments that we have accomplished through this, her encouragement, her new ideas, and the lessons that I've learned from her. And I would like to thank the student body for also um, checking your emails, all sorts of different things that you've helped me accomplish, Liz, because this wouldn't be possible without you. Thank you. Good morning. Now, I need you all to think back home or to the dorm, to your bedroom. Think about your closet full of clothes. Think about your nice warm bed. Maybe you have a desk with a laptop on it. Think about the walls surrounding your rooms, keeping out the animals, the bugs, and the weather. Maybe you have air conditioning and heating or an air conditioner just in your wall. Now imagine all of that replaced with a dozen bunk beds all in one room, humid filled air, with no air conditioner to cool it down. And also, without any of the gadgets or gizmos that we all take for granted each and every day. This is the reality for the children living at the New Life Orphanage in Thailand. In spring of 2019, Gem State sent a mission trip to this orphanage, and we got to experience the life as they live it each day. Without laptops or cell phones, without air conditioners or even walls on many of their, being, many of their buildings. Visiting these children taught me many lessons about gratitude, being careful not to take what I have for granted, and the importance of family. Every kid in this orphanage had become a family, and they were always willing to share or help one another when they were in need. From these lessons, my project, Giving Back, was born. I titled it Giving Back because I wanted to represent what my goal in the project was. These children taught me so many lessons, so I figured the only way I could even attempt to repay them was to give them some basic necessities that we all have. However, this project did not come without its glitches. I even had to change projects about four months into the process. My original project was to ado adopt an abused and neglected dog and reintegrate it into society by loving and caring for it. I had planned to use this as a therapy animal in pediatric centers, nursing homes, and hospitals. I wanted to use this animal to bring light and joy into a hurting or sad person's life, just for a couple hours. And I knew that it would take 
a lot of time, a lot of caring, a lot of driving, but I was willing to put in the time and the effort to help an abused animal and also people at the same time. On June 13, 2020, I was finally able to purchase the dog that I was looking for. And this dog just happened to be the dog literally of my dreams. She's a, a Siberian Husky puppy who also happened to fit the criteria that I was looking for for my project. But after months and months of working with her, loving her, and training her, she was almost comfortable enough to be in the same room as a stranger. So I realized that she might never actually be comfortable enough to be in a room full of strangers and in a new environment. I also had to take into account COVID-19, which hit. Pediatric centers and nursing homes aren't exactly open to the public right now, so I had to completely reevaluate my entire plan of action. I knew collecting the supplies for the children would be very time consuming. It would take lots of speaking up front, lots of driving from church to church, and hours of planning and communication with the orphanage director, Tui. But I knew that if I could bring even an ounce of joy to the children or the congregations that would be donating, it would all be worth it. So I reached out to Mrs. Stone, the Caldwell Church Secretary, and I asked her if there was a time where I could come and make my announcement to the Caldwell Church. She complied, and we found a day that worked for them and that also worked for me. So with voice, shake, voice quaking and knee shaking, I made my announcement and I answered the questions. I told them that I would be back in about two weeks to collect a bin, to collect a bin filled with donations that I would leave in the foyer. So I left the bin and I went on my way. The next Sabbath, I went to my home church in Vail and I made the same announcement, answering questions, giving details, and I could tell that my church family was extremely excited to help me donate and collect all of the items that I would need. After a few weeks, I went back and I collected all of the items that had been donated. Both of the bins were full and overflowing, way more than I expected. Some people even asked for me to come back later because they had more stuff at home that they had just forgotten. People donated things such as crayons, coloring books, Hot Wheels, toothbrushes, hairbrushes, dodgeballs, anything that they thought children in an orphanage would enjoy or need. Now, when I had made my first two announcements, I had no way of knowing how much would be donated or if anything even would be donated. So I really just had to trust that God would impress his followers to help me make this difference for these children. It wasn't until I'd collected all of the items, been in contact with the orphanage, and even gotten my shipping boxes that I realized I'd overlooked one huge detail. I had forgotten all about the shipping cost. I knew it was going to be a lot. I was, selling, I was sending 45 pounds all the way to Thailand, but unlike Harley, mine was only going to cost about $250, luckily. So I did the only thing that I could with the time that I had. I went to my parents, and after some begging and some groveling, I got them both to pay for their own box, and they were able to be sent. Thankfully, I only had the two boxes, otherwise I really would have been out of luck. On January 23rd, I was finally able to send the packages to Thailand. I had received a surplus of donations and been given a chance to bring joy to the kids that had taught me so much. On February 7th, Tui emailed me and informed me that they had received the packages. The kids were super overjoyed and super excited about everything that they had been given. Unfortunately, I'm not able to open the files that show the kids opening the project, opening the packages, sharing everything, and just how happy they are. But I know that everything that they were given, they are grateful for. Even though my original project idea seemed to flop, I was able to do one that still brought joy to others. And even though I can't see the kids opening the packages, I know that they appreciate them and that they're using everything that they were given. I also know just how much the church members love donating and how good it made them feel to be able to make this difference in a children, child's life. Also, even though I wasn't able to use my dog for the project, I still got one. <laughs> Every time I see her, she brings me a lot of joy, and it reminds me of my senior project, which then reminds me of the kids in Thailand and what I was able to do for them. As I end my speech, I want to leave you all with a challenge. 
I wanna challenge you to remember the blessings you have and how fortunate you are to live where you do and around people who believe as you do. We all have the ability to make a difference for those who have impacted us. But that begins with the realization of just how truly blessed we all are. Whenever I find myself wanting or wishing that I had this or that expensive item, I remember the kids who were content with a sun-bleached, rock-hard volleyball, and I realized that I have things pretty good. I'm just glad that I was able to help these kids know a little bit of what it's like for us and to have the things that we have. Thank you. The Senior Project is a way for the senior class to have some outreach in the community. What I chose to be my senior project is the Lego Robotics Club. The Robotics Club is an outreach that allows kids in 7th and 8th grade to have fun and also be introduced to STEM, which I will explain in a second. Now I've said that it is a robotics club, but what is robotics? What, I, what did we even get done in the meetings? And why did I even take this challenge of a project on? And what did I get from the project? STEM is the language of the world today. The introduction of STEM in today's world is important because of how the world is like, formed around science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Robotics is not part of STEM, but it incorporates two of the th four ideas of it, technology and engineering. It is technological, having to program the robot to complete different and various tasks. And it is engineering as well because you, it requires you to build the robot to complete those tasks. A robot only understands two things, off and on. This is known as binary. The programming of computers is not done in binary as it is quite complicated to write in binary. The language that programmers write in is called C. It's in here. Uh, C, yeah. Um, there are different types of computer programming language, but C language is the most basic. The code that the Lego Mindstorm uses is different from C. The coding software that the kids use has been simplified. What I mean by that is that C language that normal computers use has been changed into a program that has pictures and is easier for beginners to understand. The programming part of robotics is not something that we did. I, we didn't dive into it as much as I wanted to. But the programming that we did get to stumped the kids. After a little explanation of certain items, they figured it out and moved on. Each project that we did had a different program. This means that each project used a different motor combination and sensors, changing it from the programs that we did before. The program that all the groups started was with was a simple three touch point rover. This robot was only able to drive in, on the ground in circles or in a straight line or anything you tell it to drive. After the kids got to understand the car a little bit, we changed the, car, the simple car a little bit. We added a touch sensor on, front, on the front so that the robot would tell if it hit something on the front. Or, yeah. After the touch sensor, we added an ultrasonic sensor. This really stumped the kids when we were programming it. They figured it out how to program it after a while, and then they made it into a glorified ruler. Um, after those projects with the basic rover, we split ways. I had six different groups, and each group got to choose from four different projects I had. The projects they chose from were the gyro boy, which is on the left, the color sorter, which is on the right, the puppy, 
on the left, and the stair climber. The gyro boy is a robot that balances on two wheels with the help of a gyro. The color sorter uses a color sensor to sort different color pieces into bins without you touching it and moving it. The puppy has no other purpose than to be a puppy, but in robot form. <laughs> and the last project, the stair climber, climbs stairs, believe it or not. And the meetings were a bit chaotic, though I tried to maintain the structure. This time made the kids bored, so thus new ideas happened. Three weeks ago, one person made a bowling event, one person bowling event. They used pins and wheels, and they did make a few strikes. Though the bowling event and before it, the projects got worked on a ton, and programming those projects was intense. Though the meetings that we had, though the meetings that we had, the color sensor attached to the rover, the line follower project spiked the kids' curiosity, and we spent the whole time learning about the reflected light intensity and how the carpet read as a lower light intensity than the black lines of electrical tape I put on the board. This whole thing caused the robots to follow the outside of the paper instead of the black lines on top. After the kids found out little details about how to use the color sensor, Waterhouse and I decided to create a challenge. This is the challenge. It was a good idea in theory, but so we did not realize that red and yellow were not very different in reflected light intensity. And that if your robot doesn't have very deep programming, this loop right here is just a trap. So they got all trapped there, which was fun. The project was a project that took some effort to maintain smoothly. The reason I wanted to keep this project going is to keep working with the kids. They could be patient testing at times, but it was really good to work with them. They seemed to really enjoy having a time in the week to just play with Legos and learn the skill that they might use to learn a bigger skill later in life. I did start doing this for the senior project, but I've grown to enjoy it and look forward to it every week. From this project, I've gained patience. I know most people say that when they're talking about working with the younger kids, but I have. And, but, and through the wheel tossing and the seemingly endless bowling events, I have to say I enjoyed it. These meetings I've had for the few weeks have taught me to find the mistakes on the builds fast, taught me that though everyone says organization is key, when it is messed up, the opposite is helpful. Someone stepped on a Lego bin and it went everywhere. And this taught me just to be more patient and realize that accidents happen and we have to deal with them. Through the, this journey, filled with Legos and computers and seven and eighth graders, I've learned that I'm pretty sure I helped teach the, little kid, the kids a little about the ability to program and robotics. I thoroughly enjoyed this project and I would only change one thing. The thing I would change is the amount of meetings we had. I would definitely add to that number that we did. Even though it was somewhat overwhelming at times, this project has been a highlight of my senior year and I would definitely choose it again if I had the chance. In the end, I wanna thank Mr. Waterhouse for being so helpful and helping me guide, through, guide me through the project of robotics. And I wanna thank Mr. Crawford for donating the six computers that we used to the to do the programming and helping convert Waterhouse's office into a robotics workspace. And lastly, I wanna thank Mr. Soule for making it possible for the kids to arrive by driving the van to pick them up and bring them to robotics. And yeah. have some cookies during our break time we will reconvene at 9 30 so you have a little bit of a break and some cookies in the back
While deciding what to do for my senior project, I wanted to do something that I related to. As well, I chose a project that I wish to continue in the future, even after I graduate. Today, I want to take a moment to tell you about what I selected, the benefits it has to offer, what I did, and the highs and lows of the project. I wanted to do something that involved kids. As well, I wanted to integrate something that I felt very passionate about. Because of this, I combined community service with working with children. This would be leading kids in doing community outreach for people in need of help. I decided to call my senior project, Project Impact, because both the community and the kids I was working with were impacted by the outreach. As well, this taught the children that even though they are young, they can still make an impact on others. When I was younger, I had a teacher who taught me of the importance of community outreach. For one week each semester, we would set aside the time to go into the community and serve in any way we could. We would go to the Ronald McDonald House, which is a program that provides lodging for families and children being treated by the St. Luke's and St. Alphonse's hospitals. As well, we would go to the Idaho Food Bank and prepare meals for those in need. We would also go to the park and pick up trash and many other outreach projects. This really inspired me at a young age to always remember the benefits of outreach. Because of this, I wanted to do a project that worked with today's youth to teach them about the positive benefits of community outreach and giving back. Community outreach is about giving to those in need, contributing to your community, and helping those who cannot help themselves. Community outreach it allows us to influence the younger generation to give back to others. It helps the community to grow in a substantial way. Not only does it make you feel good, but it brings the community together as a whole. Volunteering has proven to boost self-confidence in individuals by getting them out of their comfort zone and dealing with real world problems. It also brings a certain perspective into view that may not have been aware of until you see those in need. Community outreach could relieve a person from the stress in their lives. Giving back to your community can help you feel more at peace in the world, knowing that you have done your part to help. Many of the world's greatest movements were started by community outreach projects. A little goes a long way. Volunteering connects families, friends, neighbors, and strangers, allowing us to come together to benefit others. It connects us as a community. Because of this, I wanted to do a project that reflected these values. Volunteer work is certainly a testament to a youth's character that he or she is willing to bring the change that is necessary. I believe volunteering is a place where pe young people can learn what they are passionate about. It is where you can find confidence and develop skills that will serve you for many years ahead. The benefits of youth volunteerism are plentiful and our volunteer organizations and communities reap just as many benefits when we encourage volunteerism among our nation's youth. When started at a young age, we can teach the benefits to set up youth for a future of volunteering. Youth are not only an extremely valuable resource of energy, goodwill, and creativity, but they hold the key to the future. In a culture that is so wrapped around the wants and achievements, it's easy for you to grow up without a sense of gratitude for what they have and empathy for the needs of others. Volunteering in community service projects helps others to feel fulfilled and can show a teen how enriching it is from a young age, and they will start to make an association between helping others and their own joy. This is something that we should teach at a young age to establish good habits. Because of this, the project I did was partnered with Boise Valley Adventist School. We did projects such as painting rocks with inspirational quotes and Bible verses. These rocks were then placed in parks around the city of Boise. Second, we made inspirational cards and handed them out to people or placed them on their cars. We also did a project for the shut-ins in the valley. We collected supplies for them and included handwritten Christmas cards by the kids. These were then delivered to their houses. Fourth, we made blankets for 
the Cloverdale SDA Church to give to those in need. As well, we organized the Cloverdale Church to show our gratitude for their support of the Boise Valley Adventist School. With each project, I would take the time to plan each event. This included planning what would happen, gathering the supplies, scheduling the time and day, and if needed, delivering the goods where they were intended to go. Each of these took time, but with all of these projects, my main focus was for the kids to learn the importance of helping others and how, even though they are young, they can still make an impact. This is because no act of kindness, no matter how small, is ever wasted. Although this was a project I was passionate about, it was difficult to complete at times. I ran into a few challenges along the way. One of the hardest things was finding the time to complete the work activities because of how busy my senior year is. I also ended up sick with COVID, which resulted in my absence from school and the project was delayed. As well, there were many restrictions in the Valley because of COVID, meaning that we weren't able to go to as many places as we wished. In spite of the challenges, there were many things that went well. It was very easy to gather my 20 hours. In addition, the projects were all successful and had little to no issues. As well, the children learned of the importance of outreach and showed a genuine interest in helping others and doing something outside of the regular school day. I also learned many things from this project. I learned patience with myself and others. I learned it can be difficult to feel as if you are doing enough for the community. I learned about the benefits of volunteering. I learned about the benefits of teaching habits of community outreach at a young age. I learned how to better manage my time. And I even learned that when we take the time to do something for someone else, not only are we helping them, but we are receiving a blessing too. Throughout this project, my goal was to help the community. I also aspired to teach others the benefits of outreach and how simply helping others can have a great impact on ourselves and those around us. Thank you. Would you rather spend time with the ones you care about in an environment that resembles this image or this one? I think most of us would opt for location B. In the project that I chose, the importance of one's environment, no matter who you are or what kind of situation you may be in, only became more and more of a priority to me. I first became aware of a certain need in my community when my mom, a student counselor who works firsthand with kids in the foster care system, brought to my attention the lack of a suitcase or duffel bag to carry their things. So instead, when they are moved from home to home, they have to carry all of their belongings in a plastic trash bag. However, after working on this idea of a project, I was introduced to a case aid supervisor who works for the Department of Human Services in Ontario, Oregon. She informed me of a greater need of theirs, the renovation of their visitation playground, a relatively small fenced area on the side of the department's building designated to give foster kids and their biological parents the opportunity to spend time with each other in a supervised area. This population, children that have entered the foster care system, are one of the most needy and ignored in our society today. The children that get placed in foster care come from some of the most difficult situations. Before a child gets removed from their own home, which in itself is a traumatic event, that child has already experienced enough trauma in their life to shorten their lifespan. The ACE study, originating in 1995 and stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences, showed that the more trauma a child has, the more it affects their health, including the number of years they're expected to live. 
The pyramid shown above illustrates the process by which traumatic experiences and social conditions contribute, combine to make an adverse childhood experience. These experiences affect a person's social, emotional, and mental well-being, and eventually contribute to disease, dysfunction, disability, and early death. This landmark study brought to the attention of the mental health community how tremendous of an impact trauma has on children. It affects how likely a child is to become a victim of violence in the future, on their lifelong health, and their opportunities. Being separated from one's parents is one of the most traumatic things a child can experience. The bond with a parent is so foundational to emotional health that even a dysfunctional parent, one that may be deemed unfit by the court, is still the parent to that child and no other adult has that unique bond. This is why separation is so difficult. Children get taken from their parents because the home life is so dangerous and so harmful that it isn't safe for them to stay there. Situations could be when a parent gets arrested and taken to jail, abusive situations have been discovered, if drugs are being sold or manufactured in the home, or it could just be that the living situation is so filthy that it becomes a health hazard. Children who enter the foster system do so sometimes in such emergency situations that a social worker may have to spend the night in a hotel with the child because no suitable foster home can be found. And yet, even though a child's parent may put them through this lifetime of trauma, that parent is the one that they miss most. And that bond is still so crucial to their emotional well-being. This is why it is important that the rare visits they get are positive and enjoyable. I chose this project because of this need and because of this pain that is inflicted on so many. In October of this last year, I was given the opportunity to not only take a look at the visitation playground, but I was also able to see the other indoor visitation rooms that the Department of Human Services offers for foster care kids and their families. In my first impression of the visitation playground, however, I noticed that it was a bit sparse, including only a few chairs, a small playground set, and some wooden benches. The case aid supervisor who gave me a tour of the grounds expressed to me some of their wants and priorities for the playground. This ranged from sanding and painting the benches and installing rubber tiles for flooring to possibly some new play equipment or a small sandbox. The project was originally organized and designated to the National Honor Society at Ontario High School, but due to the COVID shutdown during March of last year, they unfortunately had to postpone their plans for the playground until further notice. Because of the caliber of this project and because of what DHS wanted of the renovation and the funds that it would require, I decided to partner with the Honor Society so that it could all get accomplished. Going into this project, I wanted to do so much more than I was actually able to do. I was limited by insufficient fines, COVID restrictions that made it impossible to me, and the bulk of my project occurring during the winter months. However, in December, I was finally able to make some strides with the renovation by sanding and painting the wooden tables and benches, something that I could easily afford and accomplish on my own without breaking any of the COVID restrictions. Little to my knowledge, it was a lot bigger of a job than I really thought. But I also purchased some playground equipment, some playground balls, a couple hopper toys, and a sit and spin. When I was finished with the benches, I took it all back to the playground. Going forward, the Honor Society and I still plan on continuing these reservations this spring. In closing, I was able to learn so much throughout the process of my project. 
I was not only able to learn the skills of communication and further responsibility, qualities that I'll use for the rest of my life, but I was also able to learn of a need in my community, a need someone only living maybe a mile away from me has. I learned that in helping others, you will more often than not be unaware of the impact you may be making, whether it's big or small. And sometimes you just have to be okay with not knowing. But most importantly to me, I learned that sometimes you don't have to travel halfway across the globe to help someone, that you can help someone who maybe lives right next door to you. Everyone has heard the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. This statement encapsulates an entire thought process, which explains why photography is so pleasing to the average viewer. Pictures like these share an amazing story with no detail. This image gives you so much meaning with no words, no context. You're supposed to Fill in those voids with your own answers. The image on the left invites a person to witness a protest in France. You don't have context. You're just left with questions. Why are they protesting? And those answers are up to you to figure out. Pictures like the right have you taking the information you see and deciding what the image means to you. Two thoughts come to my mind. Either the group is mocking her or they're encouraging her. That is why photography is so beautiful. It can totally be subjected to for the viewer to make their own thoughts on a picture. This is why I chose posting in Jagrag to be my senior project, naming my project Angels Alley. The entirety of my project was a complicated process which had me changing projects, learning a new skill, and learning more about myself. Like everyone, COVID affected me a lot. And to understand why I am right here right now, I have to go back to the beginning. The beginning of my senior project, which originally was not Angel's Alley. It was a blood drive. I wished to follow my brother's footsteps, but due to unfortunate circumstances like COVID, my plans had to change. So I didn't know what to do. I was lost. I was stuck. I had this feeling of unbearable dread, which I didn't know what to do. And this year, during Camp Idahaven, something happened. An idea was brought to me, and that idea was to post pictures in a drag rag. This was kind of disappointing to me because my original project fell apart. I had no motivation. And with no motivation, why should I continue? So I started to slack off. It's natural. You, you can't do anything about that. Like, when something's ripped from you, you have this desire to hold on to it, to haunt, hold on to this dream. And my dream was dying. Eventually, I had to get out of this depression out of this stance, and I started to take interest in, you know, photography. If I wasn't good looking in front of a camera, maybe I could be good behind a camera. And this is when I learned to accept it. And with this, I had to learn a new skill. I'm an amateur. I don't know nothing. New skills are something entertaining. And with this, I had to put time and effort into learning things about photography. What makes a good picture? If I wasn't taking good pictures, then no one's going to be captured by the jag rag. And I'm gonna tell you what makes a good picture. Lighting, positioning, and angles. Lighting is important because it determines not only brightness and darkness, but mood and atmosphere. It gives you incentive to look at something. Positioning also is important because it helps you focus on a main idea. 
and angle is important because it is a defining voice and presence. It, it gives you a visual purpose. And with this information, I could start taking pictures. And like American photographer Ansel Adams said, there are no rules for a good photographs. There are only good photographs. This had me leaving this left me leaving my comfort zone. I had to go out into the world, the very scary world that we live in, and take pictures. And while, yeah, I had some good pictures, I just used what I learned to take pictures, and some of them turned out good. But more turned out bad, because I'm an amateur still. I didn't really, you know, I didn't focus. I didn't have a clear objective. But then I started to develop my skills. I started to use environments. I started to use backdrops like lakes and um, the sun, like cold mornings to help give my pictures texture, which makes it more appealing to the average viewer. And with taking pictures, you also get pictures of people, which they, people have a lot of expression and emotion. Look at Connor there. Is he mad someone took his food? We will never know. It's up to you to determine that. And we also have to learn to edit pictures. Because without editing, your pictures are on turn weird. So I use Adobe um, Lightroom to help edit my pictures to make it more visually appealing. This simple photograph of my camera in, in front of my house turns to something else when I uh, adjusted the red, blue, and green aspects of my picture to make it seem more cold. And with this, I was able to develop my photography skills to post them to Jagrag. And with this, I am able to advertise my school to not only you guys, but people who also look at Jagrags, duh. Um, sorry. So take it from me. You are able to do anything you set your mind to. I learned a lot by my, about myself with this project. I learned to learn new skills, to get things done, and to not procrastinate. I procrastinate a lot. In conclusion, when most people hear about senior projects, they get filled with a sense of nervousness, a dread. But it's not something to be afraid of. You are able to do anything. Pick something that makes you learn a new skill or something. The real check, trick to a senior project is to communicate with your mentor, and I thank Mr. Wallman to put up with my procrastinating self. And I leave you all with a challenge to pick up something new in your life. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Most of you know this beautiful man right here. He once said, the secret of doing anything is believing that you can do it. Anything that you believe you can do strong enough, you can do anything, as long as you believe. I have a deep passion for art. I love painting, drawing, creating, building, all of it. But most of all, I love people seeing it. Ex I love people exploring it on their own. Love people seeing it explore it on their own. <laughs> there are countless times where I hear people say, oh my gosh, you're so good, I could never do that. Or simply just, I can't do it, even if they haven't tried. The purpose of my project is to establish that exact idea letting kids know that they can do anything as long as they believe. The plan was to teach fifth through eighth graders art at CES. However, due to scheduling problems, I wasn't able to do so. Luckily, my other alternative was the Jerome Pathfinders. This Pathfinder group was between the ages nine and 15, many different learning levels. So my first lesson was collage. The purpose 
The whole point of this, pro this project was to see what kind of kids I was going to be working with. I told them they could do whatever they wanted. Like, something they liked to do, something that thought was cool, their favorite sport, uh, their favorite color. Some kids had a theme going on. Some, it's not working. Some had a theme going on. Some kids did something totally random. But overall, it was great to see who I'll be teaching for the rest of the year. Now it was time for the artsy stuff. The second art class was the seven elements of art. This lesson went on after this day because there was a much bigger material that needed to be covered. It was a little hard for the kids to understand at first, but later caught on to the material later on. This project was to create a seven element of art chart. Each section had to be designed based on the element description that was given to them. The point of this project was to have them develop these ideas in their mind. When they start a drawing or painting, they don't just look at something and say, this is just a blue and white box. No, this has different variations of color. This, um, where value comes into play, thick and thin lines, uh, there's texture on the cover, perspective. This is how space comes into play. There's so much more than just a two-color box. Everything I did with these kids was to help them grow as an artist, hence my title, Blooming Artists. With that being said, the next lesson was a bit more challenging, so I could push the kids a little bit. The two hardest elements that artists tend to struggle with is texture and form. On this day, I taught the kids how to draw 3D shapes. I taught the importance of a light source and how to use it in a drawing and how to bring texture into a 3D object. Everyone was so frustrated with this concept because they couldn't do it. I was right there in front of them, like showing them how to do it very quickly. But according to them, it wasn't fair because it wasn't that easy. Some threw fits, one almost gave up. I said, look, if you could write your name, you can do art. Now sit down and try again. I, I said, you can do it. So much progress was done just in one day. One kid went from this to this. There's, from the day that I came from, to the last, there has been a dramatic difference. I'm so proud of what these kids have accomplished. But unfortunately, due to sp sports, road conditions, and te having 10 million kids at the house, was, I wasn't able to drive all the way to Jerome for another art class. So I turned to Miss Fitting and asked if I could have many art lessons with their girls, Autumn and Aubrey. With them, I focused more on painting, mixing colors, and to turn things around, asked them what they wanted to do for a more fun learning experience. When we were doing our paintings, Autumn and Aubrey were frustrated that they couldn't get their paintbrushes to do what they wanted. I said, it's okay, calm down, you can do it and ended up painting beautiful butterflies. The times I spent with these girls was just, above all, a lot of fun, and I loved it. The most valuable thing that I found when I'm doing this project was seeing young people explore techniques and colors on their own. Hearing, oh my gosh, this is so fun, or I'm gonna do it again, is music to my ears, because it's one step closer to becoming better as an artist. Aubrey said, I like that we had the opportunity to choose what our subject would be and the colors we wanted to use for the next class. And I felt good about how my paintings turned out because Nayeli helped me, but also let me do it myself. And I found Autumn's kind of cute and funny. She said, I wanted to make Violet, but I didn't know how. So, so Nayeli helped me, which helped me learn how to mix colors. I felt good about my paintings. Art is not about perfecting the picture you use as a reference. It's about how you want it to look. Don't worry about how you 
how you should draw it, just draw it the way you see it. I tend to struggle with this myself because I look at the picture, then look at my drawing, it doesn't look right. So I put myself down for it because it doesn't look exactly how the picture looks. But the more I look at it and see the way I want to see it, it looks 100 times better. But Picasso did say, Let, learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. But Pathfinders believed they couldn't do it. Autumn and Aubrey were confused how to work with a paintbrush. However, in the end, they all grew as an artist. And I want to leave you with this. Encourage yourself. Try it. Believe. Because if you could write your name, you can do art. Thank you. Imagine, if you will, not being able to afford a meal. You go to the store, you pick out a sandwich, and you go through the line. All the while, people are staring at you and whispering about the way you look, the way you smell, what you're wearing. Then you get to the checkout. The lady bags your sandwich and reads you the price. You dig through your pockets to find the correct change, but you come up a dollar short. No one in the line offers to help pay. They all just snicker and judge you for not being able to afford it. But not only do you have to go another day without eating, on your way out, someone tells you to get a job and calls you a worthless bum. Unfortunately, this is not just a terrible story. Some people experience this every day. There's an evil stigma around homeless people where everyone assumes that it's not only their fault that they are homeless, but they are often, they are often regarded as dirty and gross and sometimes malicious. Sadly, this assumption many people have oftentimes prevents people from helping those in need. People can often be scared of homeless people or even grossed out. But if you dig deeper and try to talk to them and try to help, you find out that they're just regular people who've fallen on bad times. This brings me to my senior project, Bare Necessities. My project is about helping those in need, specifically homeless men. Oftentimes, people will regard hard homeless men as grosser and more dangerous than their female counterparts. This leads to the homeless men having less of their needs met. When people donate, they focus on women. They provide feminine hygiene products, women's soaps and deodorants, women's, and women's clothes. And when it comes to the outreach, the women seem less threatening or potentially dangerous, so they focus mainly on helping them. Whether intentional or not, this leaves the men feeling neglected and in need. My project aims to collect men's necessities, razors, shaving cream, aftershave, socks, and underwear, and any other men's necessities that people could donate. Now that you know the premise of my project, I'll share how I accomplished and am accomplishing it. The Boise Rescue Mission. To start off, I decided to make a plan. I decided the easiest way to collect the donations would be to follow in the footsteps of the seniors who've done this project before me. I called the Boise Rescue Mission, no answer. I called them again. This time, someone put, picked up, put me on hold, and put me through to another department, which promptly didn't answer the phone. I was happy to have made some progress, however, and wasn't discouraged, yet. Over the next couple weeks, I called them over and over again, every single department. I emailed them probably 25 times, no answer. That's where my first big problem began. The way the previous seniors had done their projects was by calling the Boise Rescue Mission and getting donation bins from them, then setting them up in local churches. I could no longer do that. With my plan falling apart, I had to think fast about what I could do to try and save it. It being late November at this point. Then the second problem hit. School closed a week early in December. I was stuck at home, three hours away. It was at this point that everything went ter terribly bad. During the glamour of Christmas break, I completely forgot about trying to work on my senior project. And even when we came back, I was too discouraged to care. 
I went about two weeks without doing a single thing, all the while pushing the thought of my impending senior project deadlines out of my mind. I didn't snap back until reality until I was driving home from work and pulled into the Walmart parking lot. There was a homeless man sitting on the median begging for money. I quickly looked him over and noticed he didn't have any shoes and his socks were dirty and full of holes, much like the ones I'm wearing right now. I looked at this man and looked right back away. I didn't notice it, but something was wrong. Something felt wrong deep inside. I went into Walmart. I bought my groceries and was pulling back out. Right before I turned, I saw this man again and froze. This time, I didn't do a judging once over like I did before, but I looked at him and our eyes met. I realized something. Hundreds of cars passed this man. No one helped. And I was just another car to drive by. That plagued my mind until I got home and I saw my senior project binder sitting on the back of my desk covered in a thick layer of dust. I didn't have to be just another car driving by. I had the means to help him and any of the other homeless men. This reinvigorated me to do my senior project. I didn't need the Boise Rescue Mission. I could do this by myself. I emailed every pastor and Adventist church in the valley. Unlike the Boise Rescue Mission, they all got back to me within a day. Caldwell, Nampa, and Cloverdale were all ecstatic to have me place a bin in their church. This was perfect. Now all I needed was time. I could only visit one church a week, so they would have to be spaced out, which was a blessing from God because the way it worked out set it up perfectly for me, be, me to be able to hit them all in a row, week after week. My new plan was finally in motion. This brought me here. The bin is at Caldwell. Now there is one in the GSAA church, and Cloverdale and Nampa will be there in the coming weeks. One other aspect of what I'm doing isn't a part of the organized donations but more of just something I've started to do in my spare time, helping individuals. I no longer wanted to be just another car driving by, and the donations helped, but not on a personal level. I wanted something more than just providing for their physical needs. I wanted to talk to them and provide any personal assistance I could, but at the same time, I'm just one man, and there's only so much I can do by myself. Recently, whenever I pass by a homeless person on the side of the street, if time and safety allow, I stop and pull over to talk to them. I ask who they are and what they're doing and if there's anything I can help with. I also have in my car a small collection of pamphlets about Jesus. I offer them a ride if they need to go somewhere or I'll sit and have a conversation with them. On Mondays when I get my tips from work, sometimes I'll stop by one of these people and offer them to buy them dinner or anything else they might need. My project wasn't done on time because of various setbacks and my own mistakes. But the way it's lining up, it's hard to believe that God didn't not have a hand in it. I'm on track to having my project completed as soon as the bins are full. If you would like to contribute or donate, there's a bin right out in the lobby. Uh, tell your parents about it, and you could easily drop off any donations on your way to church or school. Thank you. Okay, if the seniors will come forward one more time, please. As they've shared, they've worked really hard this year, and hopefully that you have received a blessing um, from their sharing this morning, and maybe it's motivated you in whatever capacity you want to give, not just because it's a class, but because it's who we are and who Jesus wants us to be. So if this, again, has been a blessing um, for you, I want to thank all of them for working so hard. I'm so proud of them. And a big thank you to Chef for the cookies and being fitting for filming this and Pastor Everett. It takes our whole team and all of the other teachers and staff who've served as mentors. This is truly a, a team project and including the students who have participate, participated as well. So one more hand for these guys. So again, thank you. And classes start at 1020 and you all have that schedule. It's a little bit different and then we'll get back to normal schedule at lunchtime today. Thank you.
Thank you, Tony.